Hello and welcome back to Complex Analysis, a video series where we talk a lot about complex contour integrals. And indeed, today in part 24, we will continue with this and talk about the so-called winding number. However, of course you know, before we start with this, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget, with the link in the description, you can download the PDF version and the quiz of this video. Okay, and with this I would say, let's start talking about the winding number for curves in the complex plane. And for this, let's recall what we mean when we talk about curves. Indeed, this is what we have defined in part 18 and 19. There we have a parameterized curve where the parameter lies in the real interval a to b. And now the only thing one needs to have a curve is that this map gamma here is a continuous map into the complex plane. However, in order to define the complex contour integral, we restricted ourselves to piecewise continuously differentiable maps. In fact, the contour integral can be generalized for more curves, but for us it's not needed. This means that all the curves we consider are piecewise continuously differentiable. Hence, whenever I say curve, I mean such a map. Okay, and with this we are ready to talk about the concept of a winding number. Indeed, we will define this number always with respect to a given complex number z0. And maybe now let's start with a very simple curve, a circle around z0. So we start here and then walk counterclockwise around z0. Hence, we count one turn around the point, which means the winding number should be 1. Now, in order to calculate this turn, for example, you could connect z0 to the curve. And then you can just look what happens to the angle when the parameter of the curve increases. Therefore, in this example, we easily see we have a total angle of 2 pi in the end. Now, another way to visualize that is that you imagine that you stand as a person at the point z0. And then you just follow the curve with your head. And then at the end you see you have completed a full rotation. Hence what you should see is that the concept here is not complicated at all. And of course here for example we could run two turns on the same circle. Obviously there the image of the curve would not look different but the parameterized curve would be another one. However, the important thing here is to see that it is not a problem to have two turns around a given point. And maybe a better curve to see this would be a curve like this. Again, if you think of the angle, you see we have two turns counterclockwise. Moreover, here you might also see that for another point z1 here for example, we don't have two turns but just one. The reason for this is easy to see when you think of the angle again, because at this point the angle would increase and decrease again. Hence in the end you just would have one full turn around z1. Therefore this is very important to remember now, a winding number for a curve is always with respect to a given complex number. Ok, but now the question is, do we have a good method to measure the turns around a given point? Or to put it in other words, what should be our definition for the winding number? And indeed we already have something for this, because we know a special integral. It's the closed integral of the function 1 over z. In fact, there we already know, it's the value 2 pi i. This is what we have already calculated, when gamma is the circle around the origin. For example, the parameterized curve could be given as gamma from the interval 0 to 2 pi, where gamma of t is given by e to the power i t. Indeed, this was not hard to calculate and it gives us the constant 2 pi i. Then of course, the picture here looks the same as before, but now z0 is just the origin. Ok, moreover, now you know if we want two turns around the origin, we can just change the curve with the interval 0 to 4 pi. 
And then without a surprise, the calculation gives us 4 pi i. Moreover, now please recall, we have learned in the last video that any curve that fits inside a circle where zero, the origin, is not inside the circle can be calculated by Cauchy's theorem. In other words, the contour integral along this curve here would be zero. And of course, this is a very important fact here. Simply because we see that the number of turns around the origin for this curve here should be zero. Or in summary, you should see that we can use exactly this integral here to define the number of turns. Or more precisely, we would use the integral divided by the factor 2 pi i. And there we immediately see this number gives us integers in the case of circles. And of course, the number of turns here should be measured with integers. And with this, we are now ready to write down the definition of the winding number. And of course, the idea is that this will now work for any curve gamma. So we define the winding number of a curve gamma around the point Z0. So you see, as before, two points are important here. We need a curve and a fixed point Z0. Now, the only restriction we have for the point is that it is not allowed to lie on the curve. Because then a winding number wouldn't make any sense. So we can simply write that 0 should not be an element of the range of gamma. Now it turns out that for the winding number there exists a lot of different notations. However, I want to keep it simple and just call it wind. More precisely, I have wind with two inputs, first the curve gamma and second the point Z0. And now as promised, we define this new number by the integral above. Indeed, the only thing we have to change is to shift the function to translate it by the point Z0. So more precisely, now we have 1 divided by 2 pi i times the contour integral of the function 1 divided by Z minus Z0. Now obviously this does not change anything from before because it's an easy substitution. And maybe we should also remove the circle here because the curve gamma is very general. However, of course in the end we will apply the winding number just for closed curves. Nevertheless, the definition here works without any problems in this general form. Therefore, let's formulate the fact we have for closed curves separately. Now, if gamma is closed, we want to show that the winding number around the point Z0 is an integer. Of course, we know this wind gamma Z0 is a well-defined complex number, but in this case now, it's also an integer. So we can write it's an element of Z. Okay, so maybe with all the things we said before, you immediately believe this, but we can also prove it. And in order to make our proof a little bit simpler, we shift the fixed point Z0 to the origin again. Indeed, this is without loss of generality because it's a simple substitution. However, we do it because then we have to write less. Moreover, we also assume that our closed curve gamma is given with the interval a to b. Okay, now the overall idea for the proof here is that we rewrite our curve gamma with an angle. So simply imagine that we have our closed curve gamma here in the complex plane. So for example, maybe here we would have the origin. However, now you know each point on the curve is a complex number and can be written in a polar form. In other words, you can use a radius and an angle to fix the complex number. Hence, we can say we have the radius rho of t. So it's the lowercase Greek letter rho we often use to denote a radius. On the other hand, the angle we denote with a lowercase phi of t. Okay, and this now means that gamma of t can be written as rho of t times e to the power i phi of t. Okay, so you should see at every point here this should be possible and therefore this defines new two functions rho of t and phi of t. And these are now real valued functions and of course they are also piecewise continuously differentiable. Simply because this is what we assumed for gamma 
and therefore it translates to the new functions rho and phi. Okay, by having this, we now should be able to calculate the closed curve integral. More precisely, it's now the closed curve integral of the function 1 over z. And by definition, we know this can be calculated by using the derivative of gamma. More precisely, instead of z, we write gamma of t. And instead of dz, we write gamma prime of t dt. Of course, this is what we have done a lot of times, but now we can use this representation of the curve gamma. So in other words, we can simply put that in. Now, the first thing is very easy. The denominator here just looks like that. And now the second part is to use the product rule to calculate gamma prime. Hence, first we have gamma prime of t times the rest plus rho of t times the derivative of the exponential function. And there it simply puts the inner derivative i times phi prime of t in front. So maybe it's a little bit lengthy, but not complicated at all. We see this because if we write it as two integrals, a lot of things will cancel out. So for example, here in the first part, the exponential function will cancel. So what remains is rho prime divided by rho. And now for the second part, you also see a lot of things will cancel, just i times phi prime remains. In other words, you see, now we have two real integrals that are very easy to calculate. The first one here, there we need an antiderivative, is just the logarithm of the positive function rho of t. Hence, the only thing we have to do here is to put in the limits a and b. And then we see for the second integral, there the antiderivative is just phi of t. So you see, also there it's easy to deal with, we just have to put in the limits a and b. Okay, and now at this point we should use that gamma is a closed curve, which means gamma of b is the same as gamma of a. And of course, this gives us a new result for the two functions rho of t and phi of t. Namely, the endpoint rho of b should be the same as rho of a. Now, this is for the radius, but of course for the angle, it has not to be the same. So phi of b can be different from phi of a. However, because it's an angle and we land at the same position in the end again, we know it has to be a multiple of 2 pi. Or more precisely, it's possible that we add an angle of 2 pi k, where k is an integer. Indeed, this is how complex numbers work, this polar representation of a complex number is not unique. However, it would be unique if you ignore such multiples of 2 pi. Okay, and now this fact here we can put into our integral calculation on the left. This immediately implies that the first integral there is 0. And moreover, the second integral is simply i times 2 pi k. Hence, after dividing by 2 pi i, we see that the winding number is exactly this integer k. And there you see, this proves our fact. Okay, so now you know what a winding number is, and we will use the next videos to calculate more complex integrals, and we will see that the winding number is very helpful there. And indeed, it will be very important for later theorems. So with that, I would say, let's meet in the next video. Have a nice day and bye.